there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you need music as much as you need food? Most say no, Bear. They need food more than music. Well, Geraldine the Mouse is happy because she just found an enormous piece of food. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what will happen when Geraldine starts hearing music coming from the food. Geraldine, the Music Mouse by Leo Leone. Geraldine had never heard music before. Noises, yes, many noises the voices of people, the slamming of doors, the barking of dogs, the rushing of water, the meows of cats in the courtyard, and of course the soft peeping of mice. But music? Never. Then, one morning, in the pantry of the empty house where Geraldine lived, she discovered an enormous piece of Parmesan cheese, the largest she had ever seen. Eagerly, she took a little bite from it. It was delicious. But how would she be able to take it to her secret hideout in the barn? She ran to her friends who lived next door and told them about her discovery. If you help me carry it to my hideout, she said, I'll give each of you a big piece. Her friends who loved cheese happily agreed. Let's go, they said, and off they went. It's enormous. It's gigantic. It's immense. It's fantastic. They shouted with joy when they saw the piece of cheese. They pushed and pulled and tugged. And finally, they managed to carry it to Geraldine's hideout. There, Geraldine climbed to the very top of the cheese. She dug her little teeth into it and pulled away crumb after crumb, chunk after chunk, as her friends carried away their cheese tidbits, Geraldine peered in amazement at the hole she had gnawed. There she saw the shapes of two enormous ears, cheese ears. As soon as her friends were gone, she went back to work again, nibbling away at the cheese as fast as she could. When she was halfway through, Geraldine climbed down to have a look at the forms she had freed. She could hardly believe what she saw. The ears were those of a giant mouse, still partly hidden, of solid cheese. To its puckered lips, it held a flute. Geraldine gnawed and gnawed until she had finally uncovered the entire mouse. Then she realized that the flute was really the tip of the mouse's tail. Astonished, exhausted, and a little frightened, Geraldine stared at the cheese statue. With the dimming of the last daylight, she fell asleep. Suddenly, she was awakened by some strange sounds. They seemed to come from the direction of the mouse's flute. She jumped to her feet. As it grew darker, the sounds became clearer and more melodious until they seemed to move lightly through the air like invisible strings of silver and gold. Never had Geraldine heard anything so beautiful. Music, she thought. This must be music. 
She listened all through the night until the first glow of dawn filtered through the dusty window panes. But as the cheese mouse was slowly bathed in light, the music became softer until it stopped altogether. Play, play, Geraldine begged. Play some more. But not a sound came from the flute. Will it ever play again? Geraldine thought as she gobbled up some of the crumbs that lay around. When the next evening approached, it brought the answer to her question. The music began faintly at dusk and lasted until the break of day. And so, night after night, the cheese flutist played for Geraldine. She learned to recognize the melodies and even in daylight, they lingered in her ears. Then one day, she met her friends on the street. They were desperate. Geraldine, they said, we have no more food and there is none to be found anywhere. You must share your cheese with us. But that is not possible. Geraldine shouted. Why? asked the others angrily. Because, because, because it is music. Her friends looked at Geraldine surprised. What is music? they asked all together. For a moment, Geraldine stood deep in thought. Then she took a step backward solemnly lifted the tip of her tail to her puckered lips, took a deep breath, and blew. She blew hard. She puffed. She peeped. She tweeted. She screeched. Her friends laughed until their hungry little tummies hurt. Then a long, soft, beautiful whistle came from Geraldine's lips. One of the melodies of the cheese flute echoed in the air. The little mice held their breath in amazement. Other mice came to hear the miracle. When the tune came to an end, Gregory, the oldest of the group, whispered, If this is music, Geraldine, you are right. We cannot eat that cheese. No, said Geraldine joyfully. Now we can eat the cheese because now the music is in me. With that, they all followed Geraldine to the barn. And while Geraldine whistled the gayest of tunes, they ate cheese to their tummies content. Mir is wondering, do you think Geraldine was surprised to find out that she had beautiful music inside her? Yes? Well, how did she get her music? Hmm. Mir wonders if it came to her because she really listened and loved it so much. Maybe so, Bear. Well, Bear is also asking if you think her friends found out that they need music as well as food. Hmm. Bear is also hoping you come back soon for more adventures in listening. Bye for now. Please subscribe. us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky and this is our friend Bear who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you thought about what you would like to be when you're grown up? Hmm. Some are asking 
What new kinds of jobs will there be in the future? Well, Louis' amazing job will be to make the clouds rain for the farmers. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if you'd like Louis' job or if there's a new job you might like more. New Jobs Full of Wonder by Al Faiso. A weather rainmaker. Like Louise, you could launch amazing micro rockets into the clouds, which cause rain to fall back on the earth. This will make the farmers very happy because rain is needed for the crops to do well so that there can be a large harvest. Would you also want to make it rain? How about a driverless car traffic controller? Elliot can decide where all the cars, taxis, and trucks move to make sure there are no accidents. Do you think it would be cool to control the cars on the roads? Or maybe you could be an urban farmer specialized in aquaponics. Maya and Eden grow fruit and vegetables using large fish tanks. The water has nutrients for the plants and the fish feed on the roots of the plants. Would you enjoy growing plants and raising fish to sell? Why not be a chef cooking insects? Charlotte cooks delicious scorpion burgers. She also prepares tasty cricket soups. Could you imagine even crazier recipes? Or would you rather be a firefighter drone pilot? Ronnie pilots magnificent firefighting drones and saves human and animal lives. And you, would you have the skills to do this job? You are lucky to have so many jobs to choose from. Maybe you should be a deep water data diver. Jack dives into the ocean to repair large boxes filled with information called data. He uses special tools to make sure that people receive internet service at the speed of a rocket. Would you like to have marvelous underwater adventures? Or do you want to be a digital privacy detective? Meta searches and deletes personal information that people don't want to have on the internet. She helps people become invisible on the web. Would you love to protect other people's secrets? Or do you wish to catch bad guys as a cyber cop? Paul fights against the attacks of the pirates on the internet. He protects other people's computers by blocking viruses and stopping scamming attacks. Would you like to protect the internet for everyone on the planet? How about a crowdfunding specialist? Angel helps others to make their dreams come true. He collects money from internet users around the world. This is possible thanks to his creativity and his great communication skills. Would you love to help people to share their great ideas with the rest of the world? If you love drawing and making things, then you could choose to become an upcycling designer. Lola transforms waste materials into new products. As if by magic, she changes toothbrushes and other used plastic objects into jewelry. And she turns cardboard boxes into furniture. And you, could you imagine other surprising things? Or you could be a 3D designer. 
Donna draws and creates awesome objects straight out of her imagination. Thanks to her computer and a fantastic printer, she can produce everything in three dimensions, 3D. This means that she can make toys, vases, shoes, whatever she wants with her incredible printer. Would you like to use your creativity to produce new things? Or maybe a big data scientist. Big data, these are all the numbers, words, photos, and videos called data, which circulate the world. The amount of data on the web is enormous and keeps growing non-stop. Stephen knows how to understand all this data and can solve problems, even before they appear. Abracadabra, he can tell you where to place a wind turbine so it catches the most wind. Would you enjoy giving meaning to data just as Stephen does? You could become a good robotics engineer like Leo. Robots are made to do things that are too boring or too dangerous for humans. Leo, the master of the robots, knows how to write instructions in robot language. In this way, he can tell the robots to efficiently do the work that humans want them to do. Would you enjoy being such a great guide? Or why not become a guardian of space safety? Neil removes the remnants of old rockets and old satellites sent by humans into space. Then he places them in a space dump to avoid any accidents. Do you look forward to making outer space less dangerous? How about a virtual presentation coach? Anna teaches others how to bring out the best of themselves when presenting. She advises them how to smile at the camera and speak clearly. And you, would you like to help others give the best version of themselves? Or do you wish to be a rewilder? Tom is an agricultural scientist who repairs the damage done to Earth by people, factories, and cars. Would you also cherish taking care of the Earth? Or, like Nina, be a nano-scientist. Nina takes tiny pieces of matter, breaks them up, and puts them back together in amazing ways. These smart materials such as super strong and foldable plastics can even be used to make cars. Would you be interested in creating new materials? Or do you wish to be a telesurgeon? Charlie carefully uses an incredible robot scalpel which can be used to operate on human beings or animals from very far away. Would you be happy to offer medical care from the other end of the world? You might be an avatar specialist as James. Avatars are virtual characters which exist only on the internet. James, who is responsible for the avatars, decides on their shape, their actions, and their extraordinary adventures. Does bringing these wonderful characters to life appeal to you? Maybe you should be a researcher in bio-inspiration. Mary makes use of great ideas taken from nature to help her solve problems. For example, she might experiment with snail slime to make a new odorless kind of glue. And you, would you have the patience to observe animals and plants? Bear's wondering, have you heard of any of these jobs? Lots of no's, Bear. 
because most of these jobs won't be possible till they're grown up. Well, Bear says he would like to launch rockets into the clouds to make rain for farmers. But he does not think he'd be very good at cooking cricket soup. <laughs> Bear also hopes you think about all you might do someday and that you come back soon for more adventures in possibilities. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky and this is our friend Bear who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you think three friends can all work together to make something great? Some yeses and some noes, Bear. Well, paint splatters red, yellow, and blue are used to painting all by themselves. Each one likes working alone. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what will happen now if red, yellow, and blue try working together. Splatter by Diane Albert. This is a story of a colorful crew made from paint splatters of red, yellow, and blue. Each of them had an artistic flair with splotches and blotches and spiky wet hair. But this crew was different from most that you'd see. They each worked alone not together as three. One color per drawing is how they'd each play, never knowing there could be a much better way. Then one lovely morning, Red gathered the crew and said with excitement, let's try something new. Instead of us painting so far apart, why don't we work on the same piece of art? They loved the idea and yelled out, We're in! What do we do first? Where do we begin? They were so happy they all could finally agree. Then Blue shouted out, I'll go first, follow me. He began to create, but got carried away, painting raindrops all over, so the rest couldn't play. The other two grumbled, this just isn't fair. We sat here waiting while you splashed everywhere. But Yellow decided to not be so glum. He still wanted to see what they all could become. So he grabbed some fresh paper to start something new. But when he began, he forgot the rest too. He made a bright sun that filled the whole space, not seeing the frown that formed on Blue's face. I wanted to play too, he complained with a pout, but each time we try, it just doesn't work out. I'm so sorry, Red. I know this was your dream, but as you can see, we can't work as a team. I know this is hard, Red said, but don't 
quit. We must try again. Please get up. Don't sit. I know this will work. I believe in our crew. We'll make something great. And we'll have fun, too. I've got some more paper, Red smiled and exclaimed. When we finish our painting, it will surely get framed. We can do something simple. We can use all our powers. Have you ever tried painting a garden of flowers? Yellow and blue always painted the sky. A garden was different, and they were quite scared to try. Red tried to help and said, It's easy to do. If you can paint circles, you can paint flowers too. Each petal's an oval, a circle stretched long. Now paint a whole bunch. You just can't go wrong. So they built up the courage to give it a shot. This is easy, Blue said. It's like painting a dot. Yellow was pleased and high-fived his friend Blue. And to their surprise, they created green, too. Soon they made orange from yellow and red. Then violet showed, too, when red and blue spread. Next came indigo, a deep navy hue. It happened when violet dashed quickly by blue. But something was missing. The sky wasn't right. It was missing some color. It was all just so white. So blue filled the sky and yellow made the sun. And together they cheered. Wow, teamwork is fun. Look what they created when they all worked together. The art was so beautiful and it was better than ever. Bear is wondering, did you enjoy seeing more than just three colors in the garden painting? Lots of yeses. Well, Bear's asking, even though red, yellow, and blue were beautiful on their own, do you think they had fun seeing how many more colors they could make together? Hmm. Well, Bear says he's glad that blue and yellow, as a team, can make grass green. <laughs> Bear also hopes you come back soon for more adventures in teaming up. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky and this is our friend Bear who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you ever gone camping and wondered if Bigfoot might be in the woods? Many are asking who is Bigfoot Bear? Well, Pete the Cat is wondering who Bigfoot is too. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see who Bigfoot is and if he's nearby. Pete the Cat Goes Camping by James Dean. Pete is excited to go camping. This is his first time. Don't forget your sleeping bag, says Dad. Or your hiking boots, Mom says. 
The campsite is deep in the woods. Mom and Dad set up the tent. Pete and Bob help collect sticks so they can make a fire later. Pete and Bob go for a hike. Bob shows Pete the footprints of different animals. Do you think we will see anything cool? asks Pete. Maybe, says Bob. Pete and his dad go fishing. They must be very quiet and very still to catch a fish. Fishing takes a long time. They finally catch some fish. Mom builds a fire. She cooks the fish for dinner. It tastes yummy. Next, Pete toasts marshmallows. Pete makes s'mores with chocolate and graham crackers. It starts to get dark out. Bob tells Pete a story about a scary, hairy giant. The giant lives in the woods. His name is Bigfoot. Do you think Bigfoot lives here? asks Pete. No one has ever seen Bigfoot says Bob. Don't let Bob scare you, says Dad. Bigfoot is not real, Mom says. Pete sighs with relief. But if he is real, I bet he's friendly, says Dad, and likes s'mores too. That's not scary, thinks Pete. Maybe he wants a s'more. Pete leaves one for his hairy friend. Soon it's time for bed. Lights out, boys, Dad says. Bob and Pete share a tent. Pete gets into his sleeping bag. It is cozy, but he cannot sleep. The woods seem extra dark, and all the sounds seem extra loud at night. Pete hears a weird swooshing sound. What is that? he asks Bob. That's just the wind, says Bob. Pete hears an odd chirping noise. What is that? he asks out loud. Those are just the crickets. Pete hears a strange hooting sound. What is that? he wonders. That's just an owl. Pete thinks of his friend owl. Pete hears a loud snapping sound. Crack! What is that, he wonders. But Bob is already fast asleep. Pete listens carefully. Crack! Is it Bigfoot? Pete peeks outside. It is too dark to see anything. When Pete wakes up, he checks the spot where he left the s'more for Bigfoot. The s'more is gone! There is a note. It says, Thanks for the treat. XOXO. Pete shows his family. Wow, I knew Bigfoot was real, says Bob. Pete knows Bigfoot is not scary. Just because he looks different does not mean he is scary. 
He even likes s'mores too. Bear's wondering, do you like marshmallowy, chocolatey s'mores? Many yeses, but some haven't tried s'mores yet, Bear. Well, if Bigfoot had not eaten that s'more, Bear says he would have been happy to chomp it down and ask for some more. <laughs> Bear also hopes you come back soon for more outdoor adventures. Bye for now. Please subscribe. Hi there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you ever visited a firehouse to see what firefighters do? Some say yes, and some no, Bear. Well, firefighter Pete the Cat is asking if you'd come along with his class to the Cat Firehouse. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if someone will need rescuing. Let's go. Pete the Cat, Firefighter Pete by James Dean. We are going on a class trip today, says Principal Nancy. She leads the class to a bright yellow bus. Everyone climbs on board. I wonder where we are going, says Pete. They are going to visit the firehouse today. The bus parks next to the bright red firehouse. Pete and his classmates are excited. The firehouse is huge. It's so big it can hold two long red fire trucks and all of the firefighters' equipment. The firefighters show the kids around. They give everyone a turn to ring the old brass fire bell outside the firehouse. Then all the kids take turns sliding down the firefighters' pole. Whee! Callie yells as she glides down. The firefighters allow the kids to try on their gear. Firefighters wear a lot of equipment. First, Pete puts on the heavy black overalls. Then, he steps into the tall black boots. A firefighter helps Pete put on the heavy yellow jacket. Finally, they place a hard black helmet on Pete's head. All this gear is very heavy. Pete can barely move. The firefighters allow the kids to explore one of the fire trucks. Callie sits in the driver's seat. She presses the horn. It's so loud that all the kids cover their ears. Then, Pete turns on the sirens and lights. The sirens blare. Woo-wee, woo-wee. The lights flash red and yellow. Suddenly, a loud bell rings in the firehouse. Oh no, it's the fire alarm. There's a fire in town. Gear up, Pete. The firefighters scramble into their gear very quickly. Pete puts on his gear too. They all climb aboard the fire truck and turn on the siren and lights. Firefighter Pete and the firefighters are on their way. Woo-wee, woo-wee. The fire engine races through town and the lights flash round and round. A firefighter presses the horn. 
all the other cars move out of the way. There's the fire. It's hot and loud, but the firefighters know exactly what to do. They work together as a team to connect the fire truck to the fire hydrant. Then the firefighters also attach a long, heavy hose to the truck. Firefighter Pete gives the signal and the firefighters turn on the water. Whoosh! The water gushes out very fast. Several firefighters must hold the hose to control it. Pete helps direct the hose as they spray the fire with water. The fire is starting to go out. There is smoke everywhere. Suddenly, Pete hears yelling from the roof. Oh no! It's Grumpy Toad! He needs to be rescued! The firefighters raise a long ladder from the truck. Crank, crank, crank. The ladder goes up and up and up. Firefighter Pete and another firefighter help Grumpy Toad climb down the ladder carefully. Yay! The fire is out and everyone is safe. The firefighters drive back to the firehouse. They take off all their gear. They pat Pete on the back and say, Good job, Pete! Firefighter Pete helps save the day. Bear's wondering, do you think Grumpy Toad will want to give Pete a big thank you? Yes? Bear's saying, what a rescue! That was close! Bear's also asking, would you like to be a brave firefighter someday and rescue people and animals from danger? Hmm, something to think about. Bear also hopes you come back soon for more adventures in helping others. Bye for now. Please subscribe. there, you found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky and this is our friend Bear who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you think Pete the Cat will have a lot of fun when he goes to the library? Some yeses and some maybes, Bear. Well, this is Pete's first time checking out the library. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see all the places Pete sees and what he discovers. Pete the Cat Checks Out the Library by James Dean. Pete's mom is taking him to the library for the first time. The librarian gives Pete his very own library card. Cool, says Pete. The librarian smiles. Time for the tour. The librarian takes Pete through the library. There is a big desk where people wait to check out books. Pete sees some of his friends reading at a long table. It's very peaceful and quiet. How relaxing. The librarian takes Pete to her favorite room. There are lots of Pete-sized chairs and tables and shelves. There are books of every shape, size, and color. What do I do now? Pete asks. Now you read a book, the librarian says. Which book should I read? asks Pete. You can read any book you like, says the librarian. Pete looks around. There are so many books. Pete picks up a book all about airplanes and jets. 
He reads it and pretends he is a stunt pilot. He flies a super fast jet and does loop-de-loops and spirals high in the sky. Then Pete finds a book with dragons, wizards, and unicorns on the cover. He reads it and imagines that he is a powerful wizard using magic spells and a special wand to defend his castle against a fire-breathing dragon. Next, Pete opens a book about spiders and insects. He reads it and imagines that he is a scientist studying all types of critters in the wild. He has to be very still to study some critters and very fast to study others. Then Pete chooses a book with all sorts of scary monsters on the cover. It is a book of fairy tales. Pete reads it and pretends that he is in a dark, spooky forest, trying to outsmart a big, bad wolf. Pete puts that book back on the shelf. It is too scary. Pete opens up a book about the pyramids in Egypt. He reads it and pretends that he is an explorer riding a camel across the desert and climbing to the top of a giant pyramid. Next, he picks a book with all sorts of robots on the cover. He reads it and imagines that he is a robot at a robot dance party. His arms and legs make whizzing sounds when he moves. When Robot Pete speaks, he says, bleep, bloop, bleep. Next, Pete picks up a book about superheroes. He reads it and makes believe that he is a superhero. He flies around the city in a colorful cape, chasing bad guys and saving the day. Then Pete spots a big book about the ocean and all its creatures. He reads it and imagines that he is a scientist in a submarine deep in the Atlantic Ocean looking for whales, squids, and sharks. There are so many wonderful books to read at the library. Pete can be whatever he imagines with a book. Reading is super groovy. Bear's wondering, did you like going to all those places with Pete? Yes, some of them. <laughs> did you imagine you were a robot at the robot's dance? Or did you ride in the submarine with Pete to see the whales? A lot of yeses, Bear. Well, is Pete right? Can you be anyone, anywhere you imagine with a book? Well, Bear hopes you come back soon for more magical adventures in books. Bye for now. Please subscribe. You found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky, and this is our friend Bear, who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Have you ever thought the first day of school might not be very fun, and then gotten a big surprise? Hmm, a few yeses, Bear. Well, 
Zach is thinking that this year will probably be like other years. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what happens when Zach's new teacher, Miss Smith, walks in. Miss Smith's Incredible Storybook by Michael Garland. It was the first day of school. Zach was waiting for his teacher to arrive. Boring, boring, he thought. Why would this year be any different from the last one? Then, the door swung open. Good morning, class. My name is Miss Smith, and I am your new teacher. Miss Smith seemed very different from Zach's other teachers. But the day went along like every school day Zach could remember until Miss Smith said, it's story time. When she sat at her desk and started to read from the book she had brought with her, Zach couldn't believe his eyes. The storybook characters came to life and the classroom was swept up in a swashbuckling pirate tail. Zack and the rest of his class were right in the middle of the story. He could feel the breeze in his hair and hear the waves pounding on the side of the ship. From then on, Zack couldn't wait to go to school. Every day there was a new story to look forward to. When Miss Smith finished reading, all the characters and adventure whooshed back into her book. On Friday, Principal Written Rotten stood in front of the class instead of Miss Smith. Miss Smith is stuck in traffic, so she has asked me to read to you until she arrives, he announced. Zack wondered what would happen next. Principal Written Rotten started to read. Zack grinned when a princess leaped out of the book, followed closely by a fire-breathing dragon and a brave knight on his horse. Principal Written Rotten was so surprised that all he could do was scream and throw the book up in fright. I'm going for help, he called over his shoulder as he ran out the door. Before Zack could think of anything to do, Sue Ann pounced on the storybook, but she didn't finish the dragon story. She started reading another one instead. The princess, the dragon, and the knight did not return to the book, but the three bears and Goldilocks climbed out. Freddy, the class clown, jumped out of his seat and tried to yank the book away. When Sue Ann let go, he tumbled backward and the book flew across the room. The whole class laughed. Billy caught the book and started reading from a new story. Zack shook his head in amazement when the Mad Hatter, the Cheshire Cat, and Alice popped out to join the others. As the book passed from kid to kid, one character after another flew out of the pages. The classroom was getting very crowded. This is trouble, Zack said to himself. The chaos was beginning to spill out into the halls. Why don't you finish the stories, Zack pleaded. But no one was listening. Miss Smith brought her car to a screeching stop in front of the school. 
uh-oh, there seems to be a little problem, she said to herself as she raced inside. Meanwhile, Zack was shouting, we have to finish the story so the characters will go back into the book. But the storybook characters didn't want to go back. A tug of war began. Miss Smith appeared in the doorway. With one look, she let everyone know she meant business. Even the dragon was suddenly silent. Zack handed the book back to Miss Smith. She ruffled through the pages, adjusted her glasses, and started to read. The class sat spellbound as she finished each story in turn. With a swirl and a whoosh, one character after another disappeared into the book until the classroom was quiet and tidy again. Principal Ritten Rotten and a team of firefighters skidded to a halt at the door just as Miss Smith closed her book. May I help you, Principal Ritten Rotten? asked Miss Smith. But the principal couldn't seem to answer. He just stared at the quiet class with his mouth wide open. Miss Smith flashed a secret smile at her class. Zack smiled right back. Who would ever have guessed that reading could be so much fun? Mira's wondering, do you think all the kids in Zack's class wanted a turn at getting storybook characters to come alive? Yes. <laughs> hmm. Would you want a turn to read in Zack's class too? Yes, is Bear. Well, Bear's also asking, do you think Principal Written Rotten will ever figure out what's going on? Let us know. Bear's hoping you come back soon for more magical reading adventures. Bye for now. Please subscribe. here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky and this is our friend Bear who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you ever feel sleepy but you hear weird noises that keep you awake? Yes, sometimes that happens. Well, Mr. Snore is very sleepy and he's about to check into the Share More Hotel for a good night's sleep. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see if Mr. Snore can get any sleep. There's a Dinosaur on the 13th Floor by Wade Bradford. Welcome to the Share More Hotel, said the bellhop. You must be Mr. Snore. Let me show you to your room. The sooner the better, said Mr. Snore. I am very uh, sleepy. Here you are, said the bellhop. Room 104. Sweet dreams, Mr. Snore. Mr. Snore thanked the bellhop, got ready for bed, crawled under the covers, and switched off the light. But as he was about to lay his head upon the pillow, he heard a squeaking sound. Hello, front desk. This is Mr. Snore in room 104. Somebody is sleeping on my pillow. Squeak. Yes, 
That would be the mouse, said the bellhop. I believe he has had a very long day. So have I, grumbled Mr. Snore, and I do not wish to share a room with a mouse. So the bellhop led Mr. Snore to a room on the second floor. Sleep tight, Mr. Snore. Mr. Snore crawled into bed and switched off the light. But just as he was falling asleep, he felt a rush of cold air. Mr. Snore called the front desk again. Someone is hogging all the covers. That would be the pig, said the bellhop. Shall I bring you another blanket? No, Mr. Snore fumed. I want another room. So the bellhop took Mr. Snore to the third floor, where there were no pigs or mice to be found. Mr. Snore kicked off his slippers, crawled into bed, and was just about to close his eyes when drip, drip, drip. Sorry about the leaky ceiling, the bellhop said as Mr. Snore marched past the ocean view on the fourth floor. This time, declared Mr. Snore, I will find my own room. He found one on the fifth floor. But I don't think you will like this room, whispered the bellhop. Unless, of course, you are fond of... Spiders! cried Mr. Snore. Quick, said the bellhop, to the elevator. How do you feel about bees? asked the bellhop. The same way I feel about spiders, said Mr. Snore. Please skip the sixth floor. The seventh floor was too hot. The eighth floor was too cold. The ninth floor was just... Giraffes, cried Mr. Snore. The bellhop smiled. Would you care to guess what's on the 10th floor? On the 10th floor, they found... Hamsters! Where are the rest of the giraffes? Asked Mr. Snore. On the 11th floor, said the bellhop. Then I will stay on the 12th said Mr. Snore. So they went to the 12th floor. Hey, it's empty, said Mr. Snore. No one ever stays here, explained the bellhop. Perfect, said Mr. Snore, and he lay down and shut his eyes. It does tend to get a bit noisy, bellhop warned, but Mr. Snore was already fast asleep. Stomp, 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 gurgle, gurgle, swish, swish. Mr. Snore rang the front desk. I cannot sleep with all this noise. I'm going to find a room on the 13th floor. Oh dear no, said the bellhop. On the 13th floor, there is a click. Mr. Snore did not wait to hear the bellhop's warning. He went up to the 13th floor. There were no mice, no pigs, no penguins, no snakes, no spiders, no dolphins. No bees and no giraffes. 
not even a hint of a hamster. Nothing but a giant room with a giant bed and a giant pillow. I do hope Mr. Snore will be all right, said the bellhop. Ring, went the phone at the front desk of the Sharemore Hotel. Hello, this is the dinosaur on the 13th floor. Somebody is sleeping on my pillow. The bellhop sighed. That would be Mr. Snore, he said. He has had a very long day. Bear's wondering, would you stay on the 13th floor? Hmm, some say they like the dinosaur's bed but aren't sure if they'd like the dinosaur. <laughs> well, Bear's asking, who did you feel sorrier for? The dinosaur who gave up his bed? Or Mr. Snore? Hmm. Bear's hoping you come back soon for more adventures in falling asleep. Bye for now. Please subscribe. You found us here at Storytime with Miss Becky. I'm Miss Becky and this is our friend Bear who loves to read along with you. Bear has a question for you. Do you ever wish you could eat your favorite food all the time? A lot of yeses and a few noes, Bear. Well, Francis only likes bread and jam. Let's put on the magic reading glasses and see what will happen if Frances only eats her favorite food all the time. Bread and Jam for Frances by Russell Hoban. It was breakfast time. Father was eating his egg. Mother was eating her egg. Gloria was sitting in a high chair and eating her egg, too. Francis was eating bread and jam. What a lovely egg, said Father. It is just the thing to start the day off right, said Mother. Francis did not eat her egg. Francis sang a little song to it. She sang the song very softly. I do not like the way you slide. I do not like your soft inside. I do not like you lots of ways. And I could do for many days without eggs. Francis spread jam on another slice of bread. Why do you keep eating bread and jam, asked Father, when you have a lovely egg? I like bread and jam, said Francis, because it does not slide off your spoon in a funny way. Well, of course, said Father, but there are other kinds of eggs. Yes, said Francis, but Sunny side up eggs lie on the plate and look up at you. And sunny side down eggs just lie on their stomachs and wait. I think it is time for you to go to school now, said Mother. Frances picked up her books, her lunchbox, and her skipping rope. Then she kissed Mother and Father goodbye and went to the school stop. 
While she waited for the bus, she skipped and sang, Jam on biscuits, jam on toast. Jam is the thing that I like most. Jam is sticky. Jam is sweet. Jam is tasty. Jam's a treat. Raspberry, strawberry, gooseberry. I'm very fond of jam. That evening for dinner, Mother cooked breaded veal cutlets with string beans and baked potatoes. Ah, said Father, what is there nicer on the plate and tastier to eat than breaded veal cutlet? It is a nice dish, said Mother. Eat up the string bean, Gloria. Frances looked at her plate and sang, what do cutlets wear before they're breaded? Flannel nightgowns, cowboy boots, furry jackets, sailor suits. Then Frances spread jam on a slice of bread and took a bite. She won't try anything new, said mother to father. Well, said Frances, there are many different things to eat, and they taste many different ways. But when I have bread and jam, I always know what I am getting, and I am always pleased. You try new things in your school lunches, said mother. Today I gave you a chicken salad sandwich. I traded it to Albert, said Francis. For what, said Father. Bread and jam, said Francis. The next morning at breakfast, Father sat down and said, Now I call that a pretty sight. Fresh orange juice and poached eggs on toast. Francis began to sing a little song. Poached eggs on toast. Why do you shiver with such a funny little quiver? Then she looked down and saw that she did not have a poached egg. I have no poached egg, said Francis. I have nothing but orange juice. I know, said Mother. Why is that, said Francis. Even Gloria has a poached egg, and she is nothing but a baby. You do not like eggs, said Mother. Have some bread and jam if you are hungry. So Francis ate bread and jam and went to school. When the lunch bell rang, Francis sat down next to her friend Albert. What do you have today? said Francis. I have a cream, cheese, cucumber, and tomato sandwich, said Albert, and a hard-boiled egg and salt shaker, and a thermos of milk, and a bunch of grapes, and a tangerine, and a cup custard. What do you have? he said. Frances opened her lunch. Bread and jam, she said. You're lucky, said Albert. That's just what you like. I had bread and jam for dinner last night, said Frances, and for breakfast this morning. I am a very lucky girl, I guess. Albert took a napkin and tucked it under his chin. He arranged his lunch neatly. I like cream cheese with cucumber and tomatoes on rye, said Albert. With his spoon, he cracked the egg. He sprinkled salt on the yolk. He took a bite of sandwich, a bite of egg, and a drink of milk. Then he went around again. 
Albert made the sandwich, the egg and the milk come out even. Albert sighed. I like to have a good lunch, he said. Frances ate her bread and jam. Then she went out to the playground and skipped rope. She did not skip as fast as she had skipped in the morning. And she sang, jam in the morning, jam at noon, bread and jam by the light of the moon. Jam is very nice. When Frances got home, Mother said, I have a snack all ready for you. I do like snacks, said Frances. Here it is, said Mother. A glass of milk and some nice bread and jam for you. Aren't you worried that maybe I will get sick and all my teeth will fall out from eating so much bread and jam? asked Frances. I don't think that will happen for quite a while, said Mother. So eat it all up and enjoy it. Frances ate up most of her bread and jam, but she did not eat all of it. After her snack, she went outside to skip rope. Frances skipped a little more slowly than she had skipped at noon. And she sang, jam for snacks and jam for meals. I know how a jam jar feels full of jam. That evening for dinner, mother cooked spaghetti and meatballs. I am glad to see there is enough for seconds, father said, because spaghetti and meatballs is one of my favorite dishes. Try a little spaghetti, Gloria, said Mother. Frances looked down at her plate. There was no spaghetti and meatballs on it. There was a slice of bread and a jar of jam. Frances began to cry. My goodness, said Mother. Frances is crying. What is the matter, asked Father. Frances sang a little sad song. What I am is tired of jam. I want spaghetti and meatballs, said Frances. May I have some, please? I had no idea you liked spaghetti and meatballs, said Mother. So Mother gave Frances spaghetti and meatballs and she ate it all up. The next day, when the bell rang for lunch, Albert said, What do you have today? Well, said Frances, setting a tiny vase of violets on her desk, let me see. I have tomato soup, Frances said, and a lobster salad sandwich. I have celery, carrot sticks, and black olives, and plums, and cherries, and vanilla pudding. That's a good lunch, said Albert. I think it's nice that there are all different kinds of lunches, and breakfasts, and dinners, and snacks. So do I, said Francis and she made everything come out even. The end. Bear's wondering, do you think Francis was brave to try new kinds of food? Yes. Do you think she was happier when she did? Well, Bear says he would really like to try her lobster salad sandwich. Would you? <laughs> Bear also hopes you come back soon for more adventures in trying new things. Bye for now. Please subscribe.